about where we're at. And secondly, I just want to say very quickly, the right to request. This, was, this, was, this came up in court that the whole basis that they used to, to establish the CIP it was under the right to request programme, which David Locke, the QC, made very clear it was in no way fitted under the right to request scheme. So if they're claiming that that's the basis on which they're paying people, they're in shaky ground. So the right to request scheme means frontline staff, clinicians, nurses, asking for this to happen. This is not what happened. It was yeah. imposed from above. So I, I did have a few other questions, but if they still... Yeah. Um, is this case a big case? Two answer that question. So one is in t just in terms of this kind of movement of social enterprises from community health services, to which the answer is that we hope that we worry any PCT that was planning on doing a similar thing and th thinking again and maybe think considering keeping the services in the NHS. Where, where, where there are plans already afoot, we're in touch with a few groups elsewhere around the country that were thinking how can we stop this from happening and now they have our experience and hopefully we'll talk to them more about stopping it. And then there's the issue of the ones that have already transferred to social enterprise and whether there's anything we can do about those, particularly the ones in the South West, which are quite close to us, where some of our fears are already being realised, you know, that certain <coughs> conditions of staff are being cut and things like that. So, so there is, there, there is we're, we're going to try and look. And then the, the bigger answer to that question is, you know, that, that, that just this social enterprise is just one way. And, and the answer to that is that I would say just by, by building a very strong movement, which is not a very good answer, but we'll answer it in more detail in terms of hearing people's ideas for how we do defend the NHS at, as a, as a, at a bigger level. Later on when I talk a bit about the whole health and social care bill. Are, are the other questions going to be more of that nature, more, you know, the, the bigger picture? Because if so, I'll, we'll move on to that. But. Just wondering if there's any question in the time scale whether And that will have to set out a new process of consultation, which will have to be over a reasonable period of time. They'll then have to review that and then come to a decision about the options. And the time scale that we're talking about is probably um, at least a minimum of 12 to 18 months and possibly a couple of years. So there is time um, to, to be able to consider now the best way forward. The complicating fact, obviously, is that the Health and Social Care Bill um, may become law, w in which case from 2013 the PCTs are abolished. Um, and so you will move into a situation where you have um, commissioning groups. So I don't know how that, that, that will complicate matters in terms of how we're going to manage this process. So it's certainly not something that's not going to happen in the next few months. Over the next 12 to 24 months is going to be a sort of time scale that's reasonable. That, that brings us rather neatly on. I think I, I'm, I'm going to move on because we'll have more time for questions later. And if you've still got questions about clarification, you can bring them up then. But I just, I, I really want to move on so that we can, we can bring more people in and have a wider discussion. I think Caroline just wanted to say something more about that. So just lastly, on time scale, that although uh, that sounds like we've got a while, I think what's also important to say is momentum is with us at the moment. I've had a lot of conversations with people over the last few weeks, and what I'm hearing in every quarter is. is oh, we're in untested waters now, and we don't really know. And I think, you know, everything's gone very quiet. The primary care trust has gone very quiet. But now is a really good time to be putting the pressure on before they start coming out and saying silly things publicly. Yeah. I'd echo that, absolutely. So I want to move on now to the, the, the health and social care bill. I'm going to really rush through this, I'm afraid, because we're a little bit behind now. So I just want to start, I hope I've got this right. Um, I think it's, it's passed its third reading on, on, in the Commons on 
Tuesday night by a majority of 65, 316 to 251. And I don't really think this is that important, but four Lib Dems voted against it and 10 abstained. That's, that's, that's why it's up. Um, over a thousand amendments were added at the last minute in ways that couldn't be challenged. If you watched it on television, you'll have noticed that very few MPs actually attended the debate. Uh, and 90 minutes was spent discussing a, a last minute discussion about abortion, which was in Dodd's you know, sort of table. So they weren't even talking about really the substance of the bill. However, it's not, it's not law yet. It's still got to go to the Lords next week. And more importantly, as the poll tax example showed, even when legislation gets passed, it can still fail to be implemented if, if there's a big and strong enough movement to stop it from being implemented. And I think that's, that, that's, that's pretty crucial, really, because we haven't got a lot of time to try and stop it any other way. We need to start thinking about what we do if it does pass. So I just want to put it in the context, our campaign in the context of the social health, health and social care bill very briefly. So we, we hear a lot that um, this health and social care bill isn't about bringing in the private sector. This is a kind of mantra that Lansley and Burns have been giving out. You know, people who think this is about privatisation haven't read the bill. That's what they keep saying. It's total rubbish. And, and one way that we can tell that it's total rubbish is it's pretty clear what the real agenda is in, with regards to our health system. You know, we, we, we can see that locally because of what's been going on with the social enterprise. We can see it locally in Sarin Cluster Hospital. The, the movement is towards privatisation, and if this bill wasn't about privatisation, it would be pretty remarkable. But it's, you know, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in more detail that it very clearly is about privatisation. So I want to go on to an article. This is an article that appeared in The Telegraph. I try to rely on stuff that isn't from the sources you would expect to when you're talking about opposition to things like the health and social care bill. This is an article by a guy called Max Pemberton, I can't really tell you anything else about him, but the headline was, read this and prepare to fight for your NHS. He describes the bill as a particularly complex and obtuse piece of legislation about three times the length of the original 1946 bill that introduced the NHS. It's going to lead to the most extensive reorganisation of the NHS that's ever been undertaken. And of course that comes in a context when uh, Cameron said that there would be no top-down reorganisation of the NHS in, in the sense of conservative and he also says that because of that extensive reorganisation, it's vital that people understand it so that they can decide for themselves if it's what they want for the NHS. And I think that's an important point, and an important point that you know, people like Lashley, they, if they want to pass such a radical reorganisation, they need to get people on side, and people are not on side. They don't even understand it, let alone uh, agree with it. He also says, and this, this comes back to what I said at the beginning about why we fight for the NHS, he says, for me, it is a fundamental part of living in a fair, just society that all members are free from the fear of destitution should illness befall them. When a cohort of people live in the shadow of the fear of sickness, society is impoverished and weakened. Now I want to move on to the key problems with the bill. So, one thing is that there's no longer going to be a single person who has responsibility for meeting health health needs of people in England. It's going to it's going to become decisions made by various different bodies. In particular, they're going to be transferred to these things called clinical commissioning groups, which are made up of GPs. And an important point here is that, okay, so this sounds like it could maybe be a good idea because they're frontline staff, but they're unelected, of course, GPs, whereas at the moment, these decisions are made by elected people. One consequence of this is that if you wanted to challenge any plans that DPG made, it's much more difficult to than if it was Lansley doing it, because their meetings might be held in private, they can decide to do that, there's nothing to stop them doing that. If we move on to the next one, even if the GPs actually do provide these services, which I'll, I'll come on to very nicely, it, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that they might, they're not going to be necessarily making decisions about where to send you for your healthcare or, or, or not to send you to healthcare on the basis of what you actually need, just on the basis of whether they want to save some money, but they're own personal interest in, in buying a new Mercedes, as the person suggested in the, the article that I read. I mean, that's, most of us actually want to trust our GPs, but you can't exclude that possibility, and it's, that's a possibility encouraged by the bill. More importantly, while GPs might be on these clinical commissioning groups, they'll also have chief executives of those groups, who may not be GPs themselves, and, and they can outsource those decisions to private bodies. In fact, they're going to be very likely to do that because they're GPs, and what they should be doing is being GPs, and they don't really want to spend their time deciding about who, which types of health care. So they get someone else in to do it. And of course, the people that they get in to do it are private sector companies, KPMG, we've mentioned already, but there's the vast of 
others. And this cycle, in, in, in summary, this means that help is not going to be planned on the basis of need, but on the basis of the business plans of a certain locality. So the next slide, I mean, because of this, you know, services that we rely on could be substantially reduced. In fact, it's not just that they could be, I would argue quickly it's almost certain that they will be. We see this any time you have privatisation, money needs to be taken out to pay the shareholders their dividends, so that money is no longer available for the service. It's kind of impossible to get around that. Unless the business is for some reason incredibly much more efficient, and what's the main way of making the business more efficient is not paying the staff, so then the service suffers in that way. Um, one of the ways that this could be bad is they can contract for services that can be very far away. As long as they're contracting for services that might be 50 miles away, how are you going to get there? And the, the CCG gets to decide which stuff is free and which stuff isn't free. So even though we keep getting this mantra, it will still be free at the point of use, that, that decision about whether something is free at the point of use goes to the CCGs and they can decide, well, we're not going to offer this without charging because it's not profitable enough. Next one. So Monitor is established as a regulator for the sector, and despite the bonfire of the quangos, it's an unelected quango. Um, it's going to have the power to decide purely on financial grounds if an area should lose its, its assets to certain services. There's also the issue of coordination. So there won't be any strategic health authorities or PCTs anymore. That does fit with the bonfire of the quangos, I guess, more. But that means you don't have coordination between health services anymore. And indeed, you can't because that would be anti-competitive and you'd introduce this market. So if you're someone who's got complex health care needs where you need to go to different parts of the NHS, you might not get the joined up care that you need. And, and I'm sure many of you already have stories of not getting the joined up care that you need because we already have an internal market in the NHS which makes that kind of stuff difficult. You need to be moving away from that rather than expanding. We also have this thing of, of, of making a two-tier NHS, lifting the cap on the amount of private money that our NHS hospitals